Welcome to the Firefighter Cancer Initiative Education Campaign. This is a project that's being led by the Center for Communication, Culture, and Change in the School of Communication at the University of Miami in conjunction with the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at University of Miami. This is part of a state-funded project and it's really designed to help educate firefighters about some of the risks associated with cancer and come up with some ways in which they can take steps themselves to help reduce their exposure to carcinogens and hopefully reduce their cancer risk. So what we've tried to focus on is really trying to create this notion that clean gear is the new badge of honor and that it's really a culture change as a way to help firefighters think about long-term changes to their behavior to reduce cancer risk. What we've got today is a presentation designed to give you some of those tools and what we're presenting is really information that we've got from firefighters themselves. My team has gone out and we've done ride-alongs with firefighters, over 250 hours of ride-alongs in 30 different stations in South Florida representing four different departments surveys across firefighters to get their attitudes and knowledge, and a lot of input from firefighters in helping us develop materials. So we hopefully are sharing things that are relevant and that come from firefighters themselves. Now we know we don't have all the answers, we don't have a cure for cancer, but what we've hopefully come up with is something that will make firefighters think about engaging in behaviors to help keep themselves clean to reduce cancer risk. When we think about cancer and we think about firefighting, we know firefighters feel that they're at a very increased risk for their risk of cancer these days. And through the ride-alongs with firefighters, we got statements that firefighters were almost fatalistic about it, feeling that every single person was going to get cancer around a table. We had a number of quotes from firefighters that really illustrated this. For example, we had a number that said something like, you know, we're not going to be able to prevent cancer. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we're going to get it. And I have no doubt that every single person sitting around this table is going to get cancer at some point in time. And we do know that firefighters are at higher risk for cancer, but we don't want firefighters to feel fatalistic. Right? Not every firefighter is going to get cancer, and there are things that can be done to help reduce that risk. So the risk of the general public, lifetime risk of getting cancer is about 40%. And the recent study by NIOSH shows that it's about 14% higher than that for firefighters. So firefighting does seem to be an occupational risk that has the tendency to increase cancer. Again, our goal today is to help firefighters develop some tools that will help them reduce their exposure to carcinogens on the job and hopefully reduce those cancer risks. We can't solve all problems. We know there's a lot of structural issues in firehouses. As we went around and visited fire stations, Every fire station we went to, a firefighter would take us around and say, look at these problems that we have. And they really seem to be focused around two things. One is the diesel exhaust from the engines. That blows on the gear in the bays, it's in the ice machines that are outside in there. They might not have positive pressure in the bunkhouse. So a lot of these structural things we see fire departments taking care of. They're aware of these risks and they're working hard to reduce them. We can't do a whole lot to help you with that. But what we want to do is focus on the other area firefighters were really concerned about, which is dirty bunker gear. And so we see a lot of issues around dirty bunker gear where they get contaminated from fires, where they get contaminated from diesel, and yet firefighters often don't take proper responses in terms of cleaning and decontamination. And what we know is historically firefighters have valued dirty gear. And it makes sense because it shows that firefighters have expertise, that they're reliable, that they've been in a lot of fires. If you look at somebody and their bunker gear is completely covered in soot, you know, man, that firefighter, they've been in a lot of fires. And when you're trusting somebody to save your life, you want somebody who's experienced. But what we're also seeing is firefighters recognizing the danger of that dirty gear. I'm going to read you a few quotes that we've got from firefighters that kind of illustrate that change in thought process that we're seeing take place right now. So one firefighter was talking about his early time in the fire service. He says, in younger days, it was a badge of honor to have dirty gear. The dirtier, the better. The more, you know, it meant you worked harder than anybody else. And we never cleaned our gear. And in fact, we talked to a number of firefighters that in that entire 10 year lifespan of the gear, they would never wash their gear a single time. And if they did get new gear, they would often go out and burn it. So another firefighter said, when we got that new gear, we purposely exposed it to the high heat to melt it, you know, to make it black, to give it that culture, you know, of that badass firefighter look. We're not finding that anymore. And so firefighters recognize how important it was historically but now they're really working to change because they see those increased cancer risks. And just about every firefighter we talk to knows another firefighter who's had cancer. One of my favorite quotes from this whole time is about one of the early firefighters who had dirty bunker gear. He quotes basically this. So times have changed. And this is a firefighter talking about his early days. Times have changed. My first day, my first shift, my first call. And smoke was blowing, black smoke rolling out. And the LT at the time, he looks at me and he says, son, don't do as I do. And he ran into that apartment without his SCBA, without his air, without his mask, without anything, just opened the back door. Now you don't see that anymore. That LT now, he's got stage four prostate cancer. 
I don't know if it's because of the fire service, but he's one of the older dinosaurs. And so we see that there is this direct correlation in firefighters' minds between those occupational risks, between the dirty gear, and their increased risk of getting cancer. But firefighters still want to know, what is the actual risk that they face from that dirty gear? And so there's a series of studies that help us answer that question. Um, a study by Fent and his colleagues, in fact, they did a couple of studies where they did a series of controlled structure burns. And they put firefighters in full gear, on SCBA, air, mass, the whole thing, had them go in, fight the fire, engage an overhaul, and then they walked 30 meters away into an open area before they doffed their gear. They tested the gear in an off-gassing canister to see what was actually off-gassing, and they found over 14 different carcinogens on over 50% of the gear being off-gassed, including things like benzene, toluene, and other carcinogens as well. In addition, they wanted to test firefighters' breath and urine to see what they were inhaling or absorbing through the skin. And what they found was elevated levels of volatile organic compounds, those same compounds, in both the breath and the urine, meaning firefighters are inhaling through the off-gassing and still absorbing through the skin. This really indicates a need for firefighters to engage in some decontamination processes, both on scene and after the fire incident, to help reduce those cancer risks. So that's what we're really working towards, is helping firefighters learn some of these dynamics about when and how to engage in this decontamination process. So this is a um, super invisible powder that's used actually um, for theft detection and cash, but um, one of the things we're trying to simulate is pretending that this is uh, black soot, just the type of same type of soot that comes off combustible and burning materials you would encounter in a fire uh, incident response. The initiative actually came to us right, uh, from the Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Department. They were very interested in understanding about how what they did for work was impacting their health, specifically how maybe being a firefighter or an EMS uh, responder may increase their risk for cancer. One of the things we were trying to do today is figure out is there a way we can demonstrate how maybe cancerous materials are transferred from a fire incident response uh, back to uh, the fire station and personal vehicle. And so today was really a teaching exercise and a scientific exercise of trying to see how we demonstrate where soot represented by this invisible dye might be transferring from when they go to respond to a fire and come back to the fire station. So the goal today was trying to be able um, to identify can we feasibly show how soot is transferred uh, from a fire incident response uh, back to their truck and back to the fire station. As you start going through the different scenarios of post-decon into the fire engine, back into uh, the bunk, into the restrooms, um, back here to the coffee table, it starts becoming less visible to the naked eye. But that powder um, that is invisible uh, over chronic exposure could be potentially causing um, cellular changes that we just uh, don't know about yet. And hopefully through some of our studies we can start identifying those changes. an eye-opening experience for us because I anticipated you know some demonstration of how much um, dye would transfer I, I didn't realize the the breadth and scope of how much dye would spread um, within the different uh, scenarios that we were shooting in as well as uh, continue to transfer on after the first uh, fire engine truck so for me it was very impressive to see even um, some of the invisible dye transfer onto the bunks where they're sleeping at night um, even if it's a smaller quantity, you could imagine that low-dose chronic uh, exposure of this dye might be potentially increasing the risk uh, over time. We filmed today in the um, EMS's 
personal vehicle, you could easily see even fainter wisps of, of plume of, of dye on the ceiling as well as on the seat that were not direct contacts but were physically visible on this, suggesting that the particulate moves around. Um, so you might not visibly see soot, and in this case we got to see a dye, but that could potentially be increasing your cancer risk. The firefighter works as a, as a fulmite and is transferring you know, carcinogen from where their, their place of work back to their personal home. So we had an opportunity to have a child with us today to be able to demonstrate maybe what happens in passing uh, some of that soap using a soccer ball. Um, so we were able to um, have a child play with one of the EMS firefighters with that soccer ball and we were able to see a second degree uh, transfer of uh, this invisible dye, i.e. the soot, transfer from the, from the EMS to the soccer ball and to the child. One of the activities that I hope uh, arises from this video that we're producing is that firefighters are a little bit more cognizant about how hy hygiene is a very important aspect um, and decontamination is an important aspect of post-incident fire response because it makes them a little bit more aware of not only of the, the soot that they bring back into the fire station but also what they might be taking to their personal homes and sharing with their families through secondary and tertiary contact of this soot um, on their on their own person. And I hope that the firefighters see that as a, more, a way of crazy, creating an opportunity for awareness and discussion of how we uh, improve um, you know, hygiene and decontamination within the fire service. So when firefighters watch this last video, they tend to get very excited about this process of cleaning and say, this is a lot bigger danger than we thought. But it's hard to know what exactly firefighters are supposed to do. There's a number of things you're already trained in, showering within the hour, for example. But there's also some other processes that fire stations are starting to engage in. And depending on where you're at, your fire department might be doing different things than others. But some things that are being recommended are things like a clean cab concept. So you want to keep all of the bunker gear out of the cab and make sure that cab stays clean from decontamination processes. Some departments are engaging in wash down in the field, whether it's just the tanks themselves for the air and the SCBA packs, or a full field decontamination process where you actually wash the gear down, wash the firefighter down, use wipes that are cleansing wipes for heavy metals to get that kind of toxins off of the skin. Firefighters and fire departments are working towards improving these kinds of processes. What we want to illustrate next is a specific process of decontamination that's been implemented in Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. And in fact, this kind of process is starting to be implemented over a lot of the fire departments in South Florida, and we think it's a pretty good model. It'll need to be adapted for different departments based on the kinds of equipment that you have, but it's not a terribly expensive or a terribly time-consuming process. And so next we want to illustrate this as another tool for you to engage in, to help you engage in decontamination and reduce your cancer risks. We know there are deadly toxins being produced in a normal structure fire, room and content structure fire, due to the uh, types of materials that we're encountering inside these homes and businesses. The things that the research has turned up is firefighters are having a significant increase in being uh, exposed to toxins in which we believe are causing cancers. And now the cancers that they're getting is almost going to surpass the natural dangers that they have on fighting fires, which is heart attacks, has always been the number one killer of firefighters, and then secondly, traumatic incidents. I think it started in 1950, and then around the 70s, 80s, you started to see a slow increase of rates of death that were linked to cancer, and then in the last, since 1990 on, it's just been a one-to-one -one ratio, if not even higher amounts, of cancer deaths compared to other things. And if we don't do something about it, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a mass epidemic where this job is going to be, it's already extraordinarily dangerous. We're going to see things that we're, you know, we're, we haven't seen before. Here's what we looked like, you know, this was a, a 70s and an 80s thing. The more blood we had on our gear and our hands and our arms and our faces, that was a badge of courage right there. We know what's inside this blood, okay? We know that we have a lot of biohazards going on inside there. All of these hazards that are in, in blood, we know what's going on with the smoke and the carcinogens. It's proven scientific fact now that those carbon particles carry carcinogenic materials inside them. And they're being absorbed and inhaled by it. So why would we expose ourselves to something that we do know is going on? Why would we continue to do that? There are two ways that firefighters 
are being exposed to these carcinogens, and that's through inhalation and absorption. So if we can limit that, the exposures, the inhalation and the absorption, we're going to do ourselves some good, we're going to save your life. Now, I want you all to take very deep breaths. This is not a difficult concept. Essentially, washing each other off after we get out of the structure fire. That's it. That simple concept will save your life. The same way when we touch a patient, and it could be a normal sickness, a fever, a cough, we're still in there washing our hands, washing our faces, and deconning after we get done with that patient. This is the same concept that we have to apply now. There's 21 members in class 64, and they're the first recruit class for Palm Beach County Fire Rescue to receive uh, this information and they were actually able to implement uh, the training and go hands-on with this process. They had a training burn that they were involved in, part of their checkoff process. The fire on the hay and the wood itself, and um, as it's building, it's not vented at first, but when you introduce oxygen into the environment, then we see how rapidly the fire builds. Um, usually we let that smoke bank down and all those particulates in the air become fuel themselves. So introducing the oxygen at that time, we see that everything becomes rapidly ignited and the heat goes up tremendously. Uh, they came out of the hot zone from their training burn. Uh, they were able to, to uh, implement the procedures and wash each other down, rinse each other down. Very simple. We take a garden hose at low pressure, okay, just normal house pressure, standard domestic pressure, and we start rinsing ourselves down. And we do a systematic approach, we stay. Now the two places that you have to really key in on is the gloves, because the, the gloves are touching everything, and the boots themselves. From there, they report to the next stage, uh, which is their doffing stage, where they take all of their gear off in a systematic approach, not cross-contaminating themselves, not uh, uh, making sure that they're keeping their hands away from their face so they're not inhaling or, or wiping any of the uh, soot and soil onto their face and onto their skin. They're taking all of their gear off appropriately, and then they're further implementing uh, a step in their process by wiping down. We have special de uh, decon wipes that we are, are using in this program uh, to wipe the actual skin and the face, the hands, the fingers, the arms, all of the exposed uh, areas uh, of the firefighter. We're wiping them down, which is further cleaning them, which is keeping them safe. Once they're done with that particular stage of the process, they then report to a proper rehabilitation area where they're getting their vitals checked and they're able to rehab appropriately with fluids any kind of uh, foods, energy bars, things like that that they need. But the bottom line is before they get to this rehab area, the bottom line is keeping this rehab area as clean as possible. All of these procedures are being done before they enter that rehab area. And hopefully what we're gonna find is this is gonna uh, reduce that potential of becoming cross-contaminated with any of those carcinogens that we know that are embedded into the gear after they come out of a structure fire. It's a very quick process, you know, it's not meant to be um, a detailed process like you would find in a hazardous material type situation. It's a very quick, it's a gross decon, it's a systematic process, it should only take us several minutes per person uh, to actually get them washed down and rinsed down. So altogether, you, you're looking at probably five to six minutes realistically. You know, the, the big point here that we want to try to get across to firefighters is this is probably not going to knock off all of those toxins. There are going to be some toxins that are going to be left on your gear. Um, they've already had the science to prove that your gear is going to continue to off gas for, for quite some time after you get out of the fire, even after you decon your gear. Your gear is still going to continue to off gas these toxins. So what, what this procedure is going to do is it's going to take those toxins and it's going to make them a lot of it is going to stick to your gear and that's going to keep those toxins from aerosolizing in the air once the, the scene is over the firefighter is done and they're heading back to the station to further emphasize and reduce those chances of those toxins being aerosolized we're going to bag that gear up we're going to take that gear we're going to put it inside of a bag we're going to close that bag we're going to tape that bag make sure that that bag is fully enclosed and that's for the ride back to the firehouse we know that the science is showing that this gear is off-gassing, so there's a good possibility that if these guys are putting the gear inside an enclosed cab on the way back to the firehouse, they, they have the potential to get exposed to these toxins. Now, once they get back to the firehouse, there's additional procedures that are gonna have to be implemented to make sure that that gear is gonna uh, get cleaned 
of all of the toxins that might have been uh, it, it might have been exposed to. So why would we expose ourselves to something that we do know is going on? Why would we continue to do that? Why don't we change the philosophy and change the mindset and get on with the and get on with this game of making sure that we're protecting ourselves? FACE Team uh, Firefighters Attacking the Cancer Epidemic has been around for the last two years here at Palm Beach County Fire Rescue and basically it's just a group of us volunteering our time to help raise awareness and implement procedures to help lower the cancer risk among firefighters. As the science is revealing uh, exactly what, what is being encountered here and we're looking at uh, this epidemic and uh, coming up with methods and technologies that are going to help our firefighters uh, live long, healthy, productive lives. You know, throughout this whole process, we're, we're talking about taking water and wetting our gear. And one of the things that firefighters have always wanted to avoid was the oversaturation or the overwetting of gear. One of the first things firefighters across the nation do once they get done fighting a fire is they, they're trying to dry out their gear as much as possible. The concept behind this is to make sure that we understand that we're only doing this for the outside shell of our gear. It's not meant for you to take off your coat and then spray the inside of your coat. The inside of your gear be wet anyway from perspiration? Yes. That's normal stuff, that's natural. What we don't want to do is dump a bunch of water down in the inside of the gear. That includes your pants as well. There are other methods and techniques that are out there that are going to be the ultimate uh, answer to this. Uh, for instance, a second set of gear. Uh, getting out of that first set of gear, having that first set of gear that we entered the IDLH professionally sent out as soon as we uh, get out of the structure, sent out, cleaned appropriately, and then returned to be brought back in service. And while it's being cleaned, we would have a second set of gear to jump into, effectively uh, keeping that fire company in service at all times. That's the ultimate. There are going to be some naysayers. It's going to happen. The majority of the guys are probably going to be naysayers because we've never seen this before. All right, so like we talked about in fire behavior and, and uh, Captain Pamplona's class, it's a new culture. We have to change the culture of the fire service, and you guys are going to do that. Really, the mindset began to shift in the late 80s when we began encountering some of these deadly diseases that we had to do a better job in deconning our emergency personnel. We have to wear gloves, first of all, and protect ourselves and put that barrier up there. We have to wear our eye protection so that we're not getting splashed in the eye. Um, it's an unknown uh, situation. We don't know what's going on with the patient or what that patient might have. We gotta have the same mindset in the fire service now when it comes to fighting structure fires. We have to do this every single solitary time if we're gonna change the mindset. If it's gonna be like washing our hands after a medical call. That's the concept that we wanna get out there. That's how bad we need to have this done. So even if your department hasn't already implemented fill decontamination, there are steps you can take to help decontaminate and reduce your cancer exposure. We've come up with a series of steps, working with firefighters, that every firefighter can do. And these include things like shower within the hour. Ultimately, we've got seven steps, and we've tried to come up with some humorous ways to frame them so firefighters will be able to remember them. So I'm going to read them to you just to get them out there. And we've also got some materials we can share to put around the fire stations so they'll be constant reminders for firefighters. So, you did that decontamination thing, right? Because if you didn't, we'll know. Step one, gross fill decontamination like a firefighting god, check. Step two, rub cleansing wipes over every inch of that beautifully fine-tuned engine of a body, check. Step three, swap out that nasty old hood for a sweet smelling one that you'd wear to your great aunt's funeral, check. Step four, bag and sell your gear like a good boy or girl, check. Because you don't want that in the cab of the engine. Five, routine cleaning when you get back to the station, just like mom would, check. Six, shower within the hour because wow, you really, really need it, check. And seven, keep that dirty gear away from your own personal vehicle because duh, check. And just about every one of these requires no special equipment on the part of firefighters. The fill decontamination, you need the hose and the process to set up, but the showering, the routine cleaning, the wiping down, the keeping the gear out of the car and out of the cab, those are things you can do right now that are gonna reduce that cancer risk. And when we think about the work we're doing with firefighters, one of the things that have come up is that people tend to think of firefighters as heroes, even if you don't think of yourselves that way. And so we really want you to be around for a long time. We want to reduce that cancer risk so you can do that job you love. 
Because even though firefighters say they're concerned about cancer, they also say there's no other job they'd rather have. So if we implement these steps, hopefully we can reduce your cancer risk, hopefully you can fight fires for as long as you want, and continue to be the heroes that everybody admires.